Hello, this is Chris Safarova, CEO of strategytraining.com and firmsconsulting.com and co-host of the Strategy Skills Podcast. And today we have with us Martin Reeves. Martin is a chairman of the BCG Henderson Institute, BCG's think tank for new ideas in management and strategy. And for most of our audience, I don't even need to explain what it is. Martin has authored numerous books, including Your Strategy Needs a Strategy and a great book, which is I'm, which is a book that I'm reading now, and it is called The Imagination Machine, about how to systematically harness imagination to generate new ideas and transform businesses. Martin, welcome. So great to have you with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Chris. Martin, before we dive in and discuss your fascinating work, to set some context, could you share with us how you became so passionate about the current type of work that you are doing? Um, yes, so I, I guess I've always been a generalist. Um, so I enjoy, you know, all I enjoyed all academic disciplines. I studied five things at the same time at university, and um, I, I was looking for a career where problem solving was the main point. And um, um, eventually, I settled on consulting and, and strategy within consulting because it is generalist problem solving. And um, so I've I've been doing that for more than thirty years, and um, uh, a, a large portion of it um, client service work, you know, solving problems across different industries. And um, uh, and then in recent years, I've I've run BCG's um, research on the topic, and um, I always felt that strategy was necessarily a, a, a sort of a living discipline in the sense that. Um, uh, you know, once you've mastered one type of competitive advantage, you know, eventually that will be competed away by others and and therefore it needs to be constantly renewed at a level of strategies, but also approaches to strategy. Um, so that's sort of what I do, really, um, figuring out the next um, frameworks and ideas and approaches that we need for uh, the ever-changing context, competitive, technological, social context of, of strategy. It's an incredible role for someone. So, so I'm myself very passionate about this topic and, and developing new models and so on. So for many people, it, it is a dream role to have where you, you can actually just develop something that people will use for many years to come. So let's dive in into your recent book because it's such a great book. I highly recommend for everyone to check it out. So it's called The Imagination Machine. So maybe before we dive into it, let's de define imagination, just in case it is not clear for some listeners. And so we are all on. Or maybe, screen. right? Or maybe let's go a little broader than that. Um, so, so wh why did I write this, and why is it called the imagination machine? Um, you know, I guess um, it's easy to confuse strategy with uh, what I call classical strategy or, or a planning-based approach to strategy, where you analyze the environment and you construct a plan. And you you iterate against a plan. Um, I mean, it struck me some years ago that this was a too narrow a definition of strategy. That we need different types of strategy in different contexts. So, in a fast changing context, we need strategies of of learning and adaptation. So that's a a different problem. Um, as uh, entrepreneurs, you know, all all companies need to renew themselves at some point. If we want to bring something new to the world, then we need strategies of creativity. Um, di modern digital platforms permit strategies of collaboration, which is a different type of strategy. And then about a third of companies at any time are in strategic renewal. So actually strategic renewal or transformation, um, I would argue, is a is a type of strategy. So, um, you know, my grand project for the last um, 15 years has been to not only um, create a sort of a way of um, selecting and, and defining these different approaches to strategy, but then to go deep on each of them. Um, so actually, I've been working my way through writing a book about each of them. So the um, so the five the five canonical approaches: classical strategy, adaptive strategy, visionary strategy, shaping strategy, and renewal strategy. Uh, we're talking about visionary strategy or creative strategy. And um, so the idea is that um, uh, you know you can't analyze the market that that doesn't yet exist. Um, it probably has more to do with creativity than it does with um, uh, with analysis and, and, and deduction. 
And um, it has a lot to do with imagination. Um, I think change uh, when we create something new has to occur twice, once in the mind, the imagination of what is possible. And then in the world, we need to then realize that idea. Um, so when, as I started to um, double click on uh, this aspect of what I call the strategy palette, which is all of these five approaches, um, it struck me that um, at one level, we all know how to imagine. Every five-year-old knows to, how to, uh, and you ask for a definition, um, think of things that don't exist that could exist, and then to bring those things about. So that's imagine, that's applied imagination. Um, it struck me that while we all in, know how to do that, that's a characteristic human capability, we don't really have a playbook for imagination. In fact, we treat it as something you couldn't possibly manage, as some rule, unruly sort of um, mystical force. And we also treat it as a very individual force. We talk about, um, you know, individual genius. And uh, we often, around innovation, tell lots of um, stories about great heroes like Steve Jobs and their special moments of inspiration. And it struck me that while there was some truth in this, it's not a very useful theory. So I set out to write a a playbook, if you like, for how to do collective imagination. So I I called it the imagination machine. It's a deliberate um, sort of quasi-contradiction because um, I think that we, you know, what is a machine? A machine is some artificially constructed device that does useful work. And what is an organization? It's an artificially constructed device that does useful work. And in this particular case, I wanted it to do the to the to do the work of um, creativity and imagination. So I would argue that, you know, all companies are built on acts of imagination. They don't get a right to exist unless they bring something new to the world. And whatever they, whatever success they have with their new thing, you know, never lasts forever. In fact, I can show that the, the period of useful um, competitive advantage is, is, is shrinking with uh, rapid digital uh, imitation. Um, so actually, every company now needs to be an entrepreneur, needs to be in the business of creative strategy. So this is a playbook for companies that need to uh, renew themselves. And it deals with a part of strategy we don't normally deal with, with with creativity and with um, what is in the mind, as as well as how to express that uh, those thoughts and ideas in, in, in reality. And it's not just about ideation. It's about the entire cycle of ideas from stimulus or inspiration through uh, ideation, um, through communication, through refinement, through institutionalization, and then through renewal. So it's the entire life cycle of ideas that I deal with. Martin, and how does imagination work? Could you maybe give us a little more detail on that? And how can it be better put to work by leaders listening to us now? Um, well, um, you know, there is some science to this question now. We know some of the neuroscience of imagination. We don't know everything. Um, so I looked at the science that existed and and I looked at the empirics of, of how imagination works um, in the hands of some of the most imaginative companies in the world. Um, and I'm sure as science, as brain science progresses, we'll understand this better. But my my working view of imagination is that um is that there is there is this cycle of ideas implicitly. I mean, um imagination is not just having ideas. It's actually realizing those ideas in the work and having in the world and having them become become pervasive. So it's the industrialization, the institutionalization of ideas. I include that in the the cycle of imagination. Um, I think the science is fairly clear that um, imagination is very much connected with um, with with certain mental abilities that humans have, and probably many other species don't have the ability to actually have uh, self awareness of our mental models. So we have a model of the world in our minds and we we can be self-aware of that model and we can do work on those um on the, on those models and um uh, and and a critical part of imagination is surprise you know why do we construct a different mental model it's because we notice that something doesn't fit with our with our current mental model and um so the first the first of six stages that i talk about in the book is um is is surprise, um, essentially, which is noticing the thing that doesn't fit, which is the clue to something that that could exist. Um, and and I, and I, and this surprise I, I I define as an anomaly, 
or accident or analogy. This is where the surprises come from. So it requires observation. So the first thing that a company has to do be, it has to, it has to be observant. It has to be externally oriented. Um, and also it needs to not just deal with averages, what is the performance across an entire period, but it needs to notice each individual customer or data point and notice the outliers because they can be the the early precedents for new for new trends and new needs. So that's stage one. You know, stage two is um, somewhat deliberately working the mental model. So once we have the surprise or the stimulus, we notice that this customer is using our product slightly differently or wants something slightly different. Then we have to sort of say, well, which business are we in? What's the best way of thinking about that? You know, how can I do work on my mental model? Now, the, the trick here is that... Um, there are techniques. This can be a systematic discipline, working a mental model. Um, in my survey of education systems, uh, be it uh, high school, uh, be it uh, undergraduate education, graduate education, um, after kindergarten, we don't get taught the art of counterfactual thinking. So we need to relearn or polish the art of counterfactual thinking. There are techniques that um, one can use, like, for example, dividing a mental model down into its elements and then recombining those elements, placing a constraint uh, on those um, on the mental models to force it to evolve or removing constraints and allow it to evolve. There are, there are techniques that one can use to systematically progress a mental model. Um, third of six stages is, um, is actually what I call the collision, which is colliding ideas with reality. Um, reality is smarter than we are. And when we collide, mental models and ideas with reality, um, two things happen. Um, everybody knows that verification happens. We get to learn whether the model works or not. Um, but but another thing happens more often, actually. Most new ideas fail. But in the process of so-called failing, they create sparks. They create the stimulus, the, uh, the anomalies and the frictions and the sparks, which are the clues to other moves we may make on the mental model. Um, and then the fourth of the six stages is um, is is the socialization of the idea, an idea that isn't adopted by others. I mean, A does not scale, and B does not evolve because as the idea passes from my mind to your mind, um, it, it evolves. And um, and 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 of course, a good idea um, is one that uh, influences many types of minds. That's a very necessary step and a very missing step in many corporations. The fifth of the six stages, and I apologize this is getting a little long-winded, but this is the entire theory in a sense. The fifth of the six stages um, doesn't sound like imagination, um, but a special type of imagine, um, imagination applies to it, then, and that is institutionalization. So if, so if you imagine the Four Seasons Hotel as legendary customer service um, in one country, and imagine they are trying to roll out that legendary customer service in a different culture um, executed by different people. How would they do that? Um, well, they couldn't just slap people on the back and say, focus on the customer because it's too ambiguous. If they gave you a 2000 page manual, um, giving every little specification of every action, this would also be not very workable or useful. So there's an art to institutionalization, institutionalizing ideas, replicating the success, industrializing the success of ideas that actually very few companies have a deliberate process for. So that's the fifth stage. And then the sixth stage um, is just seems very hard um, uh, for companies, which is renewal or self-disruption, or you might call it the encore, which is doing it not once because Actually, successful, unsuccessful companies are very, very common. Successful companies are actually fairly common, but companies that have replicated their own success three times, extremely, um, extremely rare. So if you want a company that lasts for, you know, 100 years, then, then you essentially you have to renew and you have to self-challenge. And the enemies of that, uh, the biggest enemy of that is actually past success. It's the uh, the arrogance and the complacency that comes from believing that, uh, that you're the best. So the so the very the truly best companies are actually quite paranoid and are constantly um, probing and testing um, their uh, their their mental models and their and their business models. So that's a little description of how the the set of ideas works. Martin, and as humans, we have this ability to observe. You mentioned the difference between animals and humans that we have the ability to observe, divide the world conceptually into different parts, create new relations, relations between parts, create in our mind something that doesn't even exist. And 
the question arises, why are we not naturally use disabilities more? Um, well, in, in a way, this is one of the big mysteries of consulting. Why does consulting exist? Um, if I, let me let me sort of load the question a little bit. Um, why would somebody that's been in a business for 30 years as the best in the business hire a consultant to help them with a problem? Um, the, the main reasons are very much connected to, to imagination, actually. So one of them is um, uh, we know what we know, but it's hard to know what we don't know. So cognitive diversity. Um, the idea that we're very familiar with and has brought us our past success may no longer be the best idea. How would we how would we know that? So we need we need a collision. Uh, we need a collision of minds. And then the second reason is, um, so if you like, that's a constraining force on imagination. And then the second reason is, um, you know, organizations have their own logic. So um, it, 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 it can be, um, I think is often the case that um, the majority of individuals in an organization can know something, but the organizational behavior almost persists um, in spite of something that everybody knows. Organizations get into traps. So I'll give you an example. Um, intellectually, the individuals in organizations can know that oh, we should be testing alternative mental models. We should be looking at problems creatively. However, there may be an organizational custom, which is the senior person speaks first. So we, so we have a very um, you know, hierarchical approach to, 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 to mental models. Um, and it could be that um, the companies are extremely financialized and anything that doesn't, doesn't come with a net present value, you know, people are not really comfortable with. They don't regard it as, as real. So that's a constraint, uh, a, 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 a constraint on imagination. Often the engineering function or the sales function of an organization are very strong. So the engineering function may say, for instance, exactly what you mean, do not be, give me hypotheticals. And the sales force may say, well, you know, show me the track record. Um, now those are, perfectly valid questions in their own domain, but they're hardly friendly questions if you're trying to create an environment for imagination so that you can deal with these early stage ideas in a uh, in a protective and an effective fashion so that you have the next thing to sell or the or the or the next thing to make. Um, so the, the, there's here's some of the reasons why um, for this all, the imagination paradox. We can all do it, but our organizations, often can't do it. And even if we take a step back a little bit and see our lifetime, even in school, once we leave kindergarten, we are pushed away from imagination. That's that's right. So, I mean, I, um, I'm about, uh, fortu I say fortunately, um, because it helps me to understand the importance of these things. I'm a biologist and um, originally, and um, so for me, um, play and imagination are incredibly important. Um, um, so little boys and maybe little girls nowadays, you know, sometimes play with plastic swords and engage in uh, mock combat. Um, you know, why are they doing that? Um, they're imagining that they're fighting and they're imagining that they have swords. What, what would be the alternative? What is the sort of training? They're training for combat. They're training to defend themselves. Um, what would be the alternative? The alternative would be to wait for actual opportunities of mortal combat um too late and extremely risky so play is uh, defined biologically is essentially spontaneous accelerated de-risked exploration de-risked learning and um one thing that organizations are phenomenally bad at and and adults generally are phenomenally bad at is 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 playing um now i when I write a book, I, I like to um, not only lay out the thoughts that people, I hope, embrace, um, but also I want them to embrace the behaviors. <clears throat> so in parallel to the book, um, I published a compendium of 15 executive imagination games, which are games that um, executive teams can play in order to um, recover their, uh, their muscle memory of what play is and embrace play and use play um, in order to uh, to expose assumptions and and stretch their mental models. And my experience is, this is a little un unnatural and uncomfortable initially, um, but actually, uh, once you open the door, this is something that executive teams um, really enjoy doing. 
And it can be very productive because while um, while playing, while playing with assumptions and different mental models, you can actually arrive at some very serious thoughts that you wouldn't have arrived at simply by training very hard at your current business model. Martin, and as children, we had this ability to learn much faster than adults. Mm. Yeah change kind of um, act to change things without fearing anything fearing failure imagining even alternative worlds coming up with all kinds of things in our mind and do you think it's a good idea for people to try to reconnect to what they were like when they were a child oh uh, uh, abs absolutely um I, I wrote a piece um the inspiration for the book, um, if or if you like, the test drive for the ideas in the book was a piece I wrote called The Playful Corporation. And the Playful Corporation was all about do companies need to play? Uh, what if what if companies played? And if we wanted companies to play, um, how would you do that? And um, so for some years now, I've been playing uh, playing games uh, with uh, with companies, and they are it's enjoyable, but more importantly, it's tremendously useful. So let me give you an example of a game. Um, uh, I mean, supposing you want to, supposing that intellect, you know, that you, you have been very good, you have been very successful, but you know that it's not going to last forever because you have competitors, you know, sniping at your ankles and, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you explore? Um, well, in your, in your day job, that may be a very hard thing to do. You may be too busy. Um, you may, um, the, the culture around you may demand complete explanations, financial analyses, instant results. You know, you know, unlikely that you're going to say, "Here's the complete plan for the new thing that I've just uh, that I've just thought of." You need a more uh, permissive um, a permissive environment, um, and um, so so you may need um, you may, you may need. Uh, one of the characteristics of play is that there's a playground. There is a delimited area where it's okay to play. And, um, you know, children have this. They have like a sandbox or a playground. They know that we're not actually fighting. Within this magical domain, we can play. And you can create that easily for executives. So one example is the um, the pre-mortem game. Um, the pre-mortem game is a fun game where you, uh, you imagine that in five years' time, you're doing a press conference and you're apologizing and giving a detailed explanation for the failure of your business model. You know, how did your company die? And as you can imagine, this is a very taboo thought. And uh, there's usually a lot of nervous laughter and uh, as you as you play this game. But, but of course, it pretty quickly becomes a very serious exercise where you really are imagining if we were going to fail, how might we fail? What's the most likely way of us failing? And then and then you can flesh out the detail of that, which is, well, how did we overlook that big thing, or how did we, how did we react too late? And then, uh, of course, it's it's a tremendous, uh, um, you know, the, the the Roman Catholic Church invented the um, uh, the idea of devil's advocate in the uh, uh, in the Middle Ages. It's tremendously useful to think about um, why you might be wrong. Um, it helps you to be. It also helps you to be more right. It, it, it then helps you to mobilize around a new business model. So I have 15 games like this that I that I play that really help companies to uh, to stretch their imaginations. Because one of the worst sins of um, imagination is to confuse a mental model a mental model with a fact. A mental model of your business may seem like a fact. For example, I could say we have a three percent share of the pharmaceutical industry. It may sound like a fact, um, but actually. Are we in the pharmaceutical business? Are we in the um, are we in the health preservation business? Are we in the self empowerment business? And three percent share of what? You know, what are the boundaries on this uh, uh, on this um, uh, on this definition that we get? So, a, a mental model is a choice, not a fact. Uh, there are there are always, and I think any strategist or listeners will 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 definitely resonate with this. Um, you know, in the entire end to end strategization process. Um, the framing step is the most critical step. There are always alternative ways of framing facts. Um, I am in the X business, and this is my business model. It's not a fact. It's it's a choice. And we should have, always have alternative choices. In the, in the current very dynamic environment, optionality is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a really key thing. I just actually this week had a piece published in a Harvard Business Review called Radical Optionality, which is about... Um, you know how to think about op optionality and how to have optionality in an in an economic way. 
Let's talk about how imagination is something between perception and dreaming. So perception mm -hmm. is the way we right. see reality, dreaming is dreaming. Could be sleeping, but could be even just imagining things that can never happen. And imagination still has some tie to reality. I want for our listeners yes. to really grasp this. Well, um, there are things that um, are the case that are not. Let me let me um, broaden your question slightly and say, of all of the different things that we might have in this general domain, you know, facts, counterfactuals, lies, dreams, um, fantasies, um, you know, where does where does useful business imagination fit in? So there are a couple of distinctions we can make, I think. We can make the distinction between whether something is um, is the case or isn't the case. Um, and we can make the distinction, is something inevitably the case or not the case? Or is something does something just happen to be the case or not the case? The most interesting area for imagination in business is the things that happen to be the case but but could be otherwise. So what does that mean? It means that they're grounded in the laws of physics and economics, but they're possibilities that are not yet ex explored by reality. So a good example is any major invention before we had the invention. Um, it was always possible that we could have the uh, uh, the iPad or the iPod or the or the iPhone or the typewriter or the quantum computer. Um, we just happened not to have it. Um, so. Um, now, of those things that we dream of having that we don't have, what's the difference between fantasy and and useful imagination? Um, it's what I call um, it's a matter of what I call correlation distance. So, if we're talking about something which is just very incrementally different from what we have, um, so you have this microphone in front of you, and you could make a red version of that microphone. Well, this is not a great. Uh, it's a it's a innovation. It's possibly a useful innovation. I mean, it doesn't redefine the category of of microphones. It doesn't create a new market. It doesn't cause us to reconceptualize the microphone. Um, so that's not what I'm talking about. But neither am I talking about grabbing this microphone and using it to fly to Mars in a in a vacuum um, by having sprouted wings or something. This is a fantasy. It defies the laws of physics and economics. Um, what I'm talking about is, uh, is the space of things that are grounded in facts, but are not actually true. And um, uh, I'm a great fan of um, uh, the um, the engineer Brian Arthur that ran the um, the Xerox Park Institute. He wrote a great book on technology, and and he says that most of the time technology proceeds by recombination of elements. And the great thing about recombining the elements of an existing invention is that you uh, is that if the parts work, you know it's fairly it's fairly likely that the uh, that the uh, that the assemblage works. Essentially, technology builds on previous technologies and recombines the parts. And that's often what we do with imagination. So that's that's not fantasy. That is that is you know plausible, useful innovation. It's neither incremental nor is it uh, completely fanci fanciful. Um, and that is the space in which innovative businesses operate. So conceptually, what can you do to um to to put yourself in this space? Um, well, you can stretch the boundary between what is possible and what is not possible with technological progress. You can be extremely externally oriented and and observant, so that you observe, um, so that you observe the arising needs, the emerging needs, the the uh, the, the the precedents uh, that may be uh, pointing towards the um, uh, the invention that might one 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 might be talking about. And of course, you can be very empirical. You can. You can you can create some of these recombinations of existing elements and 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 test them and 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 see what happens. It's not a and don't get me wrong. It's not a completely manageable process, um, but I, I'll argue neither it is it is a completely unmanageable process. If you think about it, um, we don't say, "Oh my God, um, human resource management." It's it involves human nature, so it's so complicated. We're not even going to try. Uh, we don't say consumer psychology. Oh, it's so complicated. We don't understand how the brain works exactly. So we're not even going to try. But for some reason, um, you know, we have been happy historically to say, um, you know, human imagination in corporations. Well, that's that's too flaky. We couldn't possibly manage that. I think we we can have a deliberate process for collective imagination. 
Yes, absolutely. And currently we are underutilizing it and we're suppressing it. It seems we are suppressing it from the time we leave kindergarten. There is no playground to play. It, we are pushed away from playing and imagining. So yes, we have a long way to go and your book is very, very, very timely and important. Another thing that many listeners will now have on their mind is of course, artificial intelligence. And I think that your book yes. is such an important work right now for people to read because it will give them a lot of confidence that actually they cannot be as easily replaced as they may assume. So let's talk about artificial intelligence. It is still developing, but it is clear it is already very powerful. Right. And this intelligent algorit algorithms will be able to handle low-level decision-making and analysis. So how can leaders, leaders prepare now for this? Right. Well, this was a major, another major motivation for the book. I mean, one motivation is that we didn't have a playbook for collective imagination. Another one is that we need that more than ever because of rapid change in the world and the rapid decay of competitive advantage. But the third one is um, the prospect of the, actually since uh, writing the book, of course, our fears about the rapid progress of artificial intelligence have, have really taken off, especially in the form of uh, large language models. So the, the idea that um, if we're to um, remain relevant as humans, we, we need to understand how, where to deploy our cognition. And so um, the book um, directly deals with some, some aspects of this. So um, one aspect is um, if we assume that, um, you know, on some time scale, certain routine activities are going to be automated away, what should the human brains be doing? And uh, basically the argument is that, um, so here I draw on the uh, the mathematician Judea Pearl. He, he distinguishes between um, three three types of cognition, uh, what he calls correlative thinking, uh, which is, um, you know, if I buy donuts, what else, what else do I buy? I buy coffee. It says nothing about causality, nothing about imagination, but it's a correlation. Well, this is machine learning. It's the, you know, essentially statistical learning, machine learning, uh, correlation models. Uh, large language models are linguistic correlation models. Um, and many um, correlative um uh, machine learning algorithms are now better than human experts, The be better than the best human experts are doing what they do. So that's not, if you want a job, that's not a very good bet to, to operate in the domain of uh, correlations. Um, on the other hand, um, we have causal thinking, which is, do I buy coffee because I buy donuts or donuts because I buy coffee? Um, well, this is because of a quirk in the way that statistics and machine learning uh, developed. Um, we don't, we still don't have very good causal algorithms although there is um uh my my interviews with experts suggest that at some point we probably we probably will have um good causal models uh, and then we have the domain of counterfactual thinking which is um thinking about things that um that don't exist but could exist uh, the domain of the imagination and uh, and of course machine learning can't analyze the data that doesn't exist on the things that don't yet exist you can't do correlative uh, analysis on things that don't yet exist. So, um, so I argue in the book that the um, the domains of relative human uniqueness, um, where we should be redeploying human cognition in corporations, are to do with purpose. You know, why why do we have the corporation? You know, we get to decide that because we we create the corporations. Um, um, ethics, um, you know. What should we do? What shouldn't we do? Um, it's it's our ethical code. We get to choose what is what is right and wrong, um, and um, and imagination, which is um, which is this this counterfactual thinking. Um, so that's sort of one one idea in the book, and um, and I I look through um, leveraging the work of Kai Fu Li, the uh, the 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 the, uh, AI, the Chinese AI specialist and investor in AI and. Uh, to, to classify different job families according to the how they tap into these three unique aspects of um, of human cognition. Um, in the last chapter of the book, I I take a slightly different angle. I I ask, will there will there ever be general artificial imagination? Um, and um, and I come to the conclusion that um, probably not in the foreseeable future. Um, but I also conclude that actually. Asking what the AI can do 
is the wrong question. Um, one has to look at the combination of the AI and the human. So, um, you know, number one, we shouldn't ask any question passively in business because the whole point of strategy is agency. It's not what will happen to us. It's what do we want to cause to cause to happen. We are we are we have agency. And secondly, um, you know, we created the algorithms of artificial intelligence. We created the data sets that they use. We choose how to use these algorithms, and we choose to put them into a certain um, business context with uh, or social context with processes and and safeguards and so on. So you need to look at the entire socio technical system. Um, so I conclude that while on the one hand we we're probably a very very long way from general artificial imagination, let alone general artificial intelligence. Um, actually, already today, artificial intelligence can be useful to supplement human discovery in each of the six steps of the of the uh, imagination, imagination cycle. For example, I said that imagination begins with surprise, uh, begins with noticing anomalies, um, which are foreshadow, which foreshadow future trends. And um, well, um, AI is very good at finding needles in haystacks. It's very easy to say, you know, against this general background, find exceptions for me. Find find me places where consumers are not using the product this way. So it's very good at surfacing anomalies. It's very good at creating analogs. If I say, like, here are here are ten things I call a creative idea. Give me twenty more. Now, what the AI will not be able to do is judge whether um, the plausibility and the feasibility and the suitability of these ideas in your particular organizational construct for many reasons. One of them being its training set is unlikely to include your proprietary private information on the environment and the capabilities of your company. Uh, but nevertheless, um, uh, we can already use, and I do use um, AI to generate um, candidate ideas that, that, that I can then screen with my own um a judgment and experience as as, as a strategist. And I I could go on through each step, but already we have uh, we have tools. So um, this 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 relates to another interesting agenda in business. I think which I call the bionic organization, which is reconceiving organization as a synergistic combination of artificial and human cognition. Completely re reconceiving the organization uh, in uh, in 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 that way. I think that is there's a handful of companies out there that are. You know, actively engaged in reconceiving the organization in precisely that way. Martin, and so this cognitive dimension of work has to become bigger and bigger focus for a business to survive. They cannot just do things the same way because yes. other people will use artificial intelligence and their business will go out of business. Mm -hmm. So companies need to become much more capable at extracting value from unique way our brain works, human brain works, the way AI cannot work right now and maybe never will be able to work. And so in your book, you give a great analogy of a huge amount of ambition and competence humans have towards tasks such as extracting oil from miles under the ocean and from organic matter embedded in rock. And that will need to apply that we will need to apply the same level of seriousness to the task of extracting value from imagination in human minds what can leaders do to master the ability to extract value from the way human brains work we have many listeners here who are working for a very large organization it can be a large consulting firm it can be a large bank or another very large company, maybe a tech company, they usually have a team of people they're responsible for under them. What can they actually do tomorrow, 8 a.m., to start implementing what you're sharing? Yeah, they, well, well, they can do a bunch of things. I, I think um, business, unlike academia, doesn't do things primarily because they're interesting or they might be true. Um, everything has to have a purpose. So I think the first thing you can do is you can understand the importance of these things because if it's important, you'll you'll do it. Business is a very pragmatic enterprise. If it's important, we do it. And um, and so I think the thing for CFOs to look at here is um, is the decay curve of competitive advantage. So if you look at super normal returns, in other words, some companies earn an excess above the cost of capital and above their competitors, and um, and always have. Um, but the question is, 
how fast does it decay relative to how it used to decay? So it used to be when I started off in consulting, that number was about 10 years. If you were across industries, if you were, uh, if you had an advantage, if you had a persistent um, edge over competitors, it's likely that your leadership would last about 10 years on average. Um, now that's somewhere between one and two years. Um, so there's been this tremendous um, acceleration of the erosion of competitive advantage. So that is why um, essentially your baseline is always sinking. So that is why you need to renew your business. And, um, and you know, most growth, uh, most long-term shareholder growth comes from, most long-term value growth comes from top-line growth, um, except in very underdeveloped markets, most top-line growth comes from innovation and the precursor to innovation is is imagination. So that's that's one big reason why you should do this. Um, the other one is to just look at the artificial intelligence revolution and say, um, what are my people going to do in five years' time? Where could this? What's the end state? And if you worry about these two things, you'll see the case for um, uh, for, for for imagination. Um, a, a second thing you can do is um, you can um, you can make sure that you remove some of the major obstacles to imagination. Um, so um, complacency is one. Um, you know, we're the best. We all went to the right schools. We're smart. Um, um, you know, our, our future is secure. Uh, complacency is very dangerous in the current environment. Complacency kills imagination. But also fear. Um, if people are fearful of making mistakes um, um, and they are punished for making mistakes, intentionally or unwittingly um no nobody's going to sort of um uh, put speculative ideas on the table um you know um a third innovation killer that is easily taken care of is introversion or extroversion um you will not see the surprise which is the beginning of the next trend which will either be an opportunity or it will be fatal unless you are looking out of the window and um, and I can show um, using uh, actually using artificial intelligence, using language models on the language of corporations, that corporations have a massive tendency to intro introversion. So a company is a bit like a sphere. The larger the radius of the sphere, the um, uh, the the smaller the ratio of the surface area to the volume. So you so a small company in a very small company, in a startup. It's likely that everybody is externally oriented. Everybody is worrying about vendors and competitors, and uh, and investors, and 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 customers. Um, in a large company, um, entire job categories can be entirely internally focused, and and this is lethal, of course, because you're seeing your own reality. You're reinforcing your own mental models. Um, you're not opening yourself up to to serendipity and uh, anomaly. Uh, and 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 uh, accident. In fact, one of the games, one of these fifteen games I refer to, is called the Mavericks game, and it's a, it's a game of deliberately looking for the seeds of the ideas that could obsolete uh, obsolete your idea, your 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 dominant mental model. Um, you can um, work on culture. Um, um, you know what happens when somebody proposes an idea in your in your company. Um, so a little ex aside on uh, another asset we created for the book, because um, I really want people to use the ideas, not just think the ideas in the book. Um, we created something called the um, the Napkin Gallery, uh, which you'll find online on the imaginationmachine.org. The Napkin Gallery comes from this sort of, these apocryphal stories about inventors creating their first sketch of a great invention on a napkin. Well, it turns out this, this is true. They often did do it on a napkin or a piece of scrap paper. And we collected those napkins and we have an art gallery, a digital art gallery full of these napkins. Um, why did we do this? Because um, we wanted to create appreciation for the, for the beauty and the quirky nature of these thoughts that change the world, not as they are celebrated as the, you know, as the perfect idea of the, of the, of the telephone or the PC, but the first time that the, these ideas receive their their, their their first worldly manifestation in the form of a sketch or a first patent or a, a first prototype, and it's fascinating. You know, for example, there's a there's a there's a napkin um, draw hand drawn by Sir Alexander Graham Bell 
um, at the precise moment he invented the uh, the telephone, and he explains that um, he wasn't trying to invent the telephone. He was trying to invent the multiplex telegraph, and his assistant accidentally plucked the transmitting reed, and he heard a sound, and his comment was he was so so glad that he didn't do he didn't know too much about electricity because the prevailing theories of the time would have told him that you cannot tra transmit sound waves using electrical wires. So this was the the messy um, first uh, conception of the telephone. This is ugly sketch. It's not clear what it is. It certainly doesn't look like a telephone. Well, all ideas that change the world from business look like that. So we have to get used to what I call ugly babies. You know, they they may grow up beautiful, but they start pretty ugly. All you know, always. And um, so, um, coming back to your question. Um, I often take executives around this gallery and they find it fascinating. They ask questions about what's this and what's that and who invented this. And But then I, I, I reveal the true purpose of the exercise. I say, well, supposing that somebody came to you with a scrappy napkin, a hand-drawn sketch, almost um, illegible, of the idea that was going to define the next hundred years of your business, what, you know, A, where are your napkins? Do you have any in your company? And B, if you had one, what would you do with the person? Would you sit down and discuss it for the three hours, promote them, um, tell them not to waste your time? And, you know, it's 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 quite a funny question, but it makes a serious point, of course, which is how sensitively are you treating early stage ideas in your company? So CEOs can make sure that you've got the right environment uh, for the for these um, for these early stage ideas. So there's, there's a lot of things that leaders can do. I'll just give you one final one because I'm fond of the story. So the... Um, uh, Unilever in India was a darling company, you know, one of the greatly admired um, uh, companies in India, um, very effective, very profitable, very innovative. But the CEO at the time, uh, who is now the COO of Unilever overall, Nitin Paranjpe, um, he um, he knew that the company was stagnating. And uh, and he did he did many things, but he did two things to reignite imagination in this uh formerly great company, this company that still thought it was great, but it was actually stagnating. Number one is um, he sent everybody out into the field to answer five questions, everybody, the receptionists, the caretakers, everybody. And one of the questions was, what surprised you? Um, so it's directly connected to imagination. And this company with no ideas came back with about 2,000 ideas. And then the second thing he did was he set a deliberately unrealistic goal um, his goal was to double distribution coverage. And this was, in, in a certain sense, a ridiculous goal because Unilever already had the highest distribution penetration of any consumer goods company in India. So doubling it would have been probably impossible and un uneconomic. But actually, he didn't set the goal for realistic reasons. He set the goal because, um, at a very um, aspirational level, because his main aim was to break existing thinking. Um, had he said, let's get an extra 10% distribution coverage, they would have achieved it without changing their mental model. He wanted to break the mental model and he succeeded in rejuvenating Unilever. So absolutely this comes down to uh, leadership and there are very concrete things that leaders can do. Martin, and what do you think about asking all our listeners to actually come home today, take a sticky note, and write their ways your napkin and put it on the laptop. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of sort of interesting questions you can ask yourself. You can, um, because the interesting thing about imagination is I'm talking about both collective and individual imagination. So we, the other nice thing about imagination is um, it's a property of a company, but it's a property of an individual too. And we can all, we can all contribute in our own, um, actually in our own interest, because of course, if our engagement, if our imaginations are engaged, we're much more likely to to find our jobs uh, uh, our jobs interesting. So some of those questions are, yeah, where is your napkin? What would you do if somebody presented you with a napkin? Um, um, what is the what is the thing? What is the last thing you saw that didn't fit with your current mental model of the business? And what is that anomaly telling you? And if you can't remember. What are you going to do to make sure you expose yourself to anomalies, uh, anomalies tomorrow? Um, another question you can ask yourself is, supposing somebody not only had a napkin, 
but they had the napkin, which in retrospect, we real you will you would have realized was indeed that the answer to the next hundred years of your business. Um, would your company pick it up and run with it? Or would it miss it? And why? And what can you do about it? So there's some really great questions uh, in my mind you can ask yourself, which um, which um, which are useful questions, but also they're empowering questions because they're pointing to our special human uh, endowments um, and and giving us giving us agency. Um, so so my own view of AI, by the way, is um, you know we can be very scared of it. We can say, oh my God, is it when is it going to take over? Um, or we can regard it as a liberating force. You know, when are we going to get liberated from the drudgery of cor correlative thinking and um, engage our uh, unique endowments to to make the world um, a, a better place? In other words, to build an imagination machine that you are a key part of. And I think when you, I, I, I so agree with you that it is empowering. So even with this question, where is your napkin? I, th I think it empowers someone to actually start becoming a person that imagines new models of how yeah. things can work. Right, absolutely. I probably like insert the adjective imag imagination in there just to avoid um, ambiguity. Where's your imagination napkin? Otherwise, people might be searching their dinner tables or something. But um, but but I mean, I, I that was a poor attempt at a joke. But um, but I, but I, I'm trying to make the point that humor is is also a very important element here, of course, because um, I mean, the opposite is fear. Of of, of course, we can fearfully um, try to um, you know find immediately profitable new um, uh, new 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 possibilities without making mistakes, um, unlikely to succeed. Um, or we can we can play and uh, we can. We can see the humorous, um, uh, humorous side of things. We can we can laugh at the ridiculous and then actually look serious at the ridiculous. I I usually explain when I'm playing these games to people, um, especially engineers. I find are likely to require a little bit of help getting into the game. And as they're getting into the game, um, I'm encouraging them to think counterfactually. And um, always an engineer will put their hand up um, and say, "Well, but that's not the case." And I say, yeah, counterfactual thinking. Remember, that's what we're doing. And, and then they'll say, that is ridiculous. And my response is, right, it seems ridiculous. Um, there are two flavors of ridiculous. One of them is um, actually ridiculous. Like in retrospect, we also think this is ridiculous. The other one is merely unfamiliar to you and antagonistic with your, antagonistic with your current mental model. How would you know the difference? You can't. That's precisely why we're doing the counterfactual thinking. Um, so, so humor, and that requires a measure of humor. So humor is very much a part of this too. Martin, I know we are getting close to the end. The last question I wanted to ask you is, earlier you mentioned that the surprise is the beginning of imagination. Mm -hmm. How can people listening to this now create more opportunities for surprise? Um, well, surprise, what is surprise? Surprise is something which departs from expectations. Um, expectations are mainly conditioned by what you have been, what you have done, what you read, what you do every day, how the people around you think. Um, so you could define a surprise as otherness relative to that. So how can you pursue otherness? Um, um, well, you can um, you can read beyond business um, is one thing. Um, you can. Uh, um, so I'm reading about um, social media ethics, the history of the bagpipe. I'm, I'm reading all sorts of things. My reading habits are um, deliberately on the edge of either side of the edge of directly relevant to everything I'm currently uh, doing because I want the new thoughts. I want the serendipity. I want the possibility of analogy. So what you read and who you meet. Um do you meet your colleagues and your year-old friends, uh, your your many multi-year friends, um, you know, in the same places, and that's it? Or um, do you seek out people with very different views to your own? Um, there's this um, series in the Guardian newspaper called, I think it's called "Dining Across the Divide," where people dine with somebody very unlike them, usually politically opposite to them. 
um, you know, I think if you listen to the other, uh, I mean, it probably has some good moral moral aspects too. You know, you 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 become more tolerant of other views. But the with respect to imagination, I mean, you're exposing yourself to different ways, uh, different ways of thinking. And um, I'm constantly trying to increase my repertoire of of men of 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 of, of mental models. Um, you can seek out anomalies. I mean, you can go looking for that data point that doesn't fit. You can write down everything you think you know about how your business works. Go find somewhere where it isn't true and ask yourself what's going on here. So there are many things that one can do. Um, you know, we have a we have an exercise in the book we call um, so we have the 15 games that we sort of industrialized, and um, but we have many other exercises too. So one of them is called um, I can't remember what we call it now, actually, but it's, the idea is deliberately show up for the wrong the wrong meeting. Um, so in most companies, I mean, there's no penalty to just showing up and sitting in on a meeting in procurement if you work in sales. Um, most of the time, we don't do that. But if you do go sit, on, sit in on a meeting in another part of the business and you try to decode what is going on, it can really broaden your picture about how does this company work? Uh, how can this company work, uh, uh, work holistically? Um, especially people in non-customer facing functions going to sit in on a meeting in a customer facing function can be can be very educational so it's a it's a strategy of achieving agency in your own activities deliberately seeking out uh enrichment and departure from your norms and and customs that reinforce your ex your existing mental models this is such a powerful place to end our session today. Before we do that, Martin, do you have anything you want to share and where people can find out more about you, get all the resources, get the book, anything you want to share? Um, so I think um, so we have the, the 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 website for the for the book, um, the imaginationmachine.org. What you'll find there is um you'll find you know interviews with executives on the topic, you'll find articles you'll find links to the book you'll find the uh imagination gallery you'll find the imagination games so that's one place you can look if you're interested in today we just talked about a portion of my research portfolio and if you're interested in what else i'm working on um then you can go to um um uh, the uh bcg henderson institute uh site uh bcg uh, henderson institute.org and um you'll see um for instance, we just published this piece in Harvard Business Review on radical optionality, um, how to achieve optionality in spite of the, the increasing cost of capital as interest rates are rising and uncertainty premium, premium are rising. Um, uh, you'll see that we have done a lot of work on how to bring politics into the into the strategy process. Um, um, you know, as we as we know from sort of uh, Disney and Florida and other events, everything is Everything is now highly politicized in in business, and um, uh, you can treat that very peripherally in corporate affairs, or you can integrate that with strategy. How do you integrate that with with strategy, strategy making? Um, we've done a lot of work on resilience, um, a much used word during COVID. What, but what actually is resilience? How do you how do you measure it? You know, how much is it worth? What are the practices of resilience? What can we learn from biology um, about resilience? Um, and many other topics. So you can um, go to the bstghenderseninstitute.org uh, to see that. Martin, thank you so much for spending this hour with us. I really appreciate it. You are a treasure. And uh, for everyone tuning in, our guest today have been Martin Thieves. The last name is spelled R-E-E-V-E-S, if you struggle to find the books. Check out Martin's powerful book, The Imagination Machine, and all other resources Martin shared. And I'm looking forward to see you all next time. Thank you very much.